Take out your Bibles. That's not bad. I'm half deaf and I still heard you, so that's good. That's good. Take out your Bibles and turn to Matthew 15. Matthew 15. They read it for us earlier today, so thank you so much for that. Let me ask you this question. What is more important? What you do or why you do it? I want y'all to think about that some tonight. I'm not just going to answer straight out, but I want y'all to realize and think about it's not just about what we do. It also is about why we do it. There's a, a famous guy a long time ago. He said that what matters to God is not so much how we act, but why we act. So I'd ask you, do you agree with that? I think he's right. It matters why we do what we do. And that's what this passage tonight that we're going to talk about is all about. You know, a lot of times we'll end up doing right things, but maybe for the wrong reasons. And if you're doing things just because you're doing it out of habit or maybe to keep up appearances so that you look good in front of everybody, you know, all those things might feel right to you and you might actually be doing right things but why are you doing those things? Are you doing them to glorify God? Or are you doing them because that's just what you do? And there's a big difference between those two. So you can do good things and not, not mean much. So think about that tonight as we're, we're reading in our scripture, because we're going to talk about the Pharisees tonight, and they're going to seem like the bad guys. But I want you to realize we're not that much different than the Pharisees. We could fall into the same traps that the Pharisees fell into. You see, the Pharisees were respected leaders of the time, and yet they still fell into these traps. But Jesus is going to call them out tonight. In the very passage that they read earlier, you saw that happening. And we're going to see that again tonight. So let's go to our first slide. We're going to look at verses 1 and 2. All right. So, the first thing I want y'all to realize is the question that comes to Jesus. So, pay attention to the question. Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the traditions of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. All right, so that's the question. The Pharisees come in, and the Pharisees are coming down. Now, the Bible says right there they came from Jerusalem. I know that might seem like a throwaway comment, but it's actually an important comment because these weren't just any Pharisees that were dispersed across the, the dispersion of all the Jews everywhere. These were the Jews that were at the center from Jerusalem. And so they were well-respected. They are highly revered at the time. And they were probably the strictest of the strict, right? So when they see something happening that they think is not right. They come up and they ask a question to Jesus. And their question is, why didn't your disciples wash their hands before they eat? Now, what is so important about washing your hands? You know, back then, they didn't know about germs. So like when we're talking about let's wash our hands, and y'all probably hear that a lot, especially since COVID came out, wash your hands frequently, because you don't want germs or viruses, right? That's not what they were concerned about. Because back then, they didn't even know about germs, right? Now, they knew you didn't want to eat something that had dirt on it. That's pretty obvious. But they didn't necessarily know about germs, the things that you can't see, right? So why are they so worried about it? I'm going to tell you it's because it was a ceremonial thing. And let me kind of explain to you just a little bit about what they were doing. There, there wasn't anything moral about this. This wasn't like an ethical or a moral, like doing right, doing wrong kind of thing. This was really more about their ceremonies that they were used to. You know, what they had, they, they had a, a teaching back then that they felt like people would be unclean if they did certain things. And this uncleanness is something that it would kind of like, it would cling to the person, almost like an infection would. Kind of like, I guess today you could say COVID. Like if someone's infected with COVID, you're like, oh, they're, 
infected. We have to stay away from them. Well, that's because you're thinking they're unclean. That's kind of similar to how the Pharisees viewed uncleanness. Like today, maybe, um, maybe there might be like a four-leaf clover or a horseshoe. And maybe one of your friends says, oh, I got to touch that four-leaf clover. I got to rub that horseshoe or rub that rabbit's foot because it brings good luck. Right? Y'all, have y'all seen anybody ever do that before? Well, the reason they think that that brings good luck is not true. It's not real. But it's the same kind of concept, only opposite. Whereas if you might touch a horseshoe for good luck, if you touch something that made you unclean, the Pharisees said, you're not clean. And so for them, that's what the problem was here. They felt like the disciples were being unclean. So they were saying, watch out. We don't want to be around that. What, what is going on? Why aren't they doing the same thing everybody's always done, which is wash their hands a certain way? And they had a certain way that they would wash their hands, and they wanted to make sure that they were clean before they ate. So what is the problem here? The problem is it's not a bad thing to wash your hands before you eat, right? How many of y'all wash your hands before you eat? How many of you have parents who want you to wash your hands before you eat? Okay. The rest of you, they probably do. You just don't know it yet, but that's okay. So washing hands before you eat is not the issue here. The issue is that this tradition had become so important to the Pharisees that they thought there was a problem because Jesus' disciples were not following this tradition. These rules and these regulations that they came up with became their religion. So that's where the issue lies. You know, these things, were, they were preoccupying the minds of the Pharisees. So my question to you is, what preoccupies you? What are you thinking about all the time? Because that has the potential to become a tradition for you. Remember, I said the Pharisees fell into this pitfall, but be careful not to say, oh, those are the bad guys, we're the good guys. Because we can fall into that same pitfall. What preoccupies you, that might become your tradition. You see, when people start adding to the scriptures, they give you all these extra rules in addition to what the scripture tells you to do, that starts becoming tradition. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Some of those things that they're saying to do could be good things. They could go go along with scripture. But you know what? When that becomes more important than the scripture, that's where the problem is. So these Pharisees were used to people washing their hands before they ate. They were used to other things. They were used to these traditions. So my question is, what are you used to? Is there something that you just feel like you, it feels right if you do it? Is that your tradition? Is it so important to you that you've got to follow that tradition, whatever it is? I want you all to kind of think about that a little bit because we're going to come back to that thought in just a minute. You know, in, you know, when we're talking about today and trying to connect it to things today, think about how you come to tribe. Or maybe when you go to school. There's people you're used to hanging out with, right? You're used to being around those friends, right? You're used to sitting with those friends on Wednesday night and on Sunday morning. You're used to playing gaga ball with them and everything else. You're used to those friends. What if a new person came into that realm? What if a new person wanted to come and meet you? What if a new person was maybe a little bit different and still wanted to be around you? Would you say, you know what, that doesn't feel right. I'm going to go with my tradition of hanging out with my friends that I'm used to. That could be a tradition that you're setting up for yourself that you don't even realize it. See, it's not a bad thing to have friends. But do you think Jesus would want us to shut out other people? Probably not, right? Jesus wants us to love others, and especially other Christians. He wants us to love each other. And so if our traditions of hanging out with our friends on a certain row with a certain seats get spoiled by some new person coming in, maybe we should think, wait a minute, is that a tradition that I've got? Or is that something I really need to pay attention to? You see, Jesus is going to tell us in just a minute how they should be acting. And so we see what the question is. The Pharisees come in and they ask this question. 
They say, why aren't they washing their hands before they eat? And when somebody comes up and challenges us, what do we normally do? Oh, he's holier than I am. I can tell you what, because if I got challenged, I'd get defensive. But you know what? Quoting scripture is a good thing to do. That's really good. But a lot of times, we'll get defensive in what we say. We might say, you know what? That's not the case. I'm not doing that. Or we'll make up excuses. Or we'll come up with reasons why we did it. But you know what? Jesus doesn't do that. He's going to respond to this question. And we're going to see what Jesus' response is in the next few verses. So starting at verse number 3, and you can go to the next slide if you want. Starting at verse 3, as soon as I find it. All right, there it is. All right, he answered them. This is his response. He says, and why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? Uh-oh. Now we're getting kind of busy here. So Jesus is going on the offensive, going back and telling the Pharisees, why are you breaking commandments? And so he says, why do you break the commandments of God for the sake of your traditions? For God commanded, honor your father and your mother. And whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if anyone tells his father or his mother, what you would have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. What is he talking about? Why would the Pharisees be doing this? What were they doing? Why would they not be taking care of their father and mother? Everybody's heard that honor your father and mother before, right? That's one of the ten, right? The Ten Commandments. That's a pretty big one. That should be something we're trying to follow, right? Why would the Pharisees set up traditions that would cause them to break that commandment? Well, here's the key. This is the thing. They called it Corbin. Everybody say Corbin. Corbin. That's a fun word to say. Corbin. Corbin basically means to be devoted to God. It means it's a gift to God. And so what's happening is in that day and age, they wanted people to make sure they followed through with their oaths, with their promises. That's a good thing, right? How many people would say it's good to keep your promises? That's good. That's good. So what they're saying is if you devote something to God, if you give something to God, you should follow through with your promise. Sounds like a good thing, right? Well, that's what Corbin started out as, right? But here's the problem. Let's say I've got some parents that are aging, they're elderly, and you know I've also got maybe about 20 acres of land over here. Maybe it's in the desert. Maybe it's prime desert realty over in Israel somewhere. But I've got 20 acres of land that I'd like to use for something. But you know what? My parents are going to have to be taken care of. So me, as an Israelite back in Jesus' day, I might say, you know what? I'm going to declare Corbin for these 20 acres of land. I'm going to say, I'm going to give these 20 acres of land to God, which means that I'm going to give it to the temple. And when I die, the temple of God will get all that land. That's a big donation, right? That's a big deal, right? Well, here's the catch. If I promised that land to the temple, or promised to devote it to God, made that declaration, I've made an oath, but hey, guess what? Now I can't sell that to get money to help my parents. So I don't have to lose that land until I die. But I promised it to the temple, so I can't sell it to help my parents. So someone else better take care of them, and I get to use my land the rest of my life. That sounds like kind of like a loophole, right? Y'all know what loopholes are? All right, that's kind of like a loophole, right? They're promising something to God. They get to use it the rest of their life. Then they die. They give it to the temple. That's great. But all that time, the parents were being forgotten. What do you think about that? Does that sound like that honors the parents? No. And that's exactly what Jesus was telling these Pharisees. He said, you've got this Corbin thing, this, this big complicated situation where you think you're trying to keep your promises, but in reality, people are using that to not honor their parents. That's a bad thing. Because God told us to honor your father and mother. You know, the honoring the father and mother, that's one of the Ten Commandments. The Corbin tradition was a loophole to get it out from it, right? We wouldn't do that today, would we? 
this would be the same kind of thing as, um, let's think about tribe tonight. On Wednesday nights, we like to sing and praise God, right? How many of y'all like to sing and praise God? I think it's awesome. I think it's great. It's biblical. We should be praising God. And every time we gather together, it's not a bad idea for us to sing praises to God. We better get used to it because when we get to heaven, Revelation tells us that we're going to be praising God a lot, right? So that's all good. That's biblical for us to praise God, right? But, you know, I kind of noticed that a lot of times when the praise and worship team comes up, we sing three songs. Three. Not two, not four, but three. Praise team sings three songs. Well, that's good. That helps us praise and worship God. That's a biblical concept, right? That's all good. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that at all. That's a good thing. But what if there were some Pharisees that came in, got used to three songs, and suddenly, one night, the praise and worship band only sang two songs? Wait a minute. Now the Pharisees in the back are saying, well, if you're going to praise God, you've got to sing that third song. If you don't sing that third song, you're not doing what you're supposed to do. Well, that's not exactly right, is it? You can still praise and worship God with two songs. It doesn't have to be three. Or what about this? What about they sing three, and then the praise and worship team sings a fourth song? And that Pharisee jumps up in the back, and he's like, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. You can't do four. It has to be three. Because that's what we've always done. That's a tradition. So, is the tradition of singing three songs on Wednesday night bad? No, it's a good thing. It helps us praise God. It helps us be biblical. And that's what Corbin was meant to be by helping them keep their oaths. But they had twisted it. They had turned it into a tradition of man that was more important than the commandment of God. And so they were saying... You have to do this. That's why you, your disciples have to wash their hands in order to do what the tradition says. And Jesus is saying, no, y'all got it all wrong. You misunderstand. You're putting tradition above the commandment of God. And he gave him this example of this Corbin. That's exactly what we're talking about here. So the real question here isn't about tradition, commandment, all this and that. The question is, who gave the authority for each of those. The tradition of Corbin was something they got used to. It's something that men were doing. It was something that humans were doing over time. So that's authority of humans. But who gave us the word of God? Who gave us the word of God? Who inspired the word of God for us? God, thank you, yes. So God gave us commandments... But men give us tradition. Which way should it be? We need to follow the commandments of God, not the tradition of men. And that's what Jesus is saying. His disciples weren't breaking the commandments. They were just not following all of the traditions that they had set up. And that's the difference. You have to be able to distinguish. Now, how do we know if we're honoring a tradition or scripture? Hmm. Well, if we're honoring a tradition versus scripture how can i tell the difference well one of those is in the bible right hmm i think we need to know the bible better if we understand oh we always do this but then we're saying wait a minute are we doing that because we just always done it or are we doing that because that's scriptural and we might say we come on wednesday night we sing and praise that's scriptural but does it have to be three songs that part's tradition. And there's nothing wrong with that tradition because it supports the scriptural part. But how can we know what's scriptural if we don't read the Bible? That's why you have to dig into the Bible. That's why you need to be reading the Bible because people at this church, people at this country, people everywhere will give you all kinds of rules and tell you all kinds of things. And some of them are good. Some of them might not be so good. But how do you know if it's scriptural? It's because you've been studying the Word of God. How can you hear if God is telling you something? How can you recognize His voice if you haven't been listening to His voice in His Word? We know what God sounds like because He sounds like what's in the Bible. That's why you've got to dig into the Bible to distinguish if something is scriptural or tradition. And again, the tradition is not necessarily bad, but if you put it above God's commandments, that's a problem. 
that would be a problem. All right, so Jesus not only responds to him, he starts quoting scripture. Where's my quote scripture guy? All right, that's right, Jackson. Jesus quotes scripture back to him. So let's go, he's going to quote Isaiah. Starting at verse 7, he says, you hypocrites! Everybody awake? Everybody good? All right. I don't think Jesus said that like, you hypocrites. I think he said it a little more forcefully, forcefully, right? He said, you hypocrites! Why? <sighs> well, did Isaiah prophesy of you? Now he's saying Isaiah told about them in advance. He says, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. That kind of describes them. They're teaching as if commandments were their, their traditions. That's a problem. But what's a hypocrite? So, what's your... All right, so let's style it back in for a second. So she said a hypocrite is when they do one thing, or they say one thing, and they do something else. Yes, so that could be considered a hypocrite. You know what? Hypocrites became a normal part of the language because of how Jesus used it in the Bible. The way they used it back in the Greek times, they were describing a, a stage actor that plays a role. That's really what the Greek word hypocrite came from. They were saying it's an actor that holds up a mask. And think about it. If somebody's acting one way, but they really feel another way, that's a hypocrite. If somebody's acting like they're all nice, and behind their back they're stabbing people in the back, and they're talking bad about them all quietly, but over here they, they look all smiley face and everything's happy, that's a hypocrite, right? And Jesus is telling these Pharisees they're hypocrites. And the proof that he has for it is this scripture. And it's amazing the, the parallels between when Isaiah said these words to the people that he was talking to, and when Jesus said these words to the people he was talking to, because Isaiah made this prophecy about the people that were around him at the time. And Jesus says, this prophecy is about you Pharisees. So it's about both of them. The similarities are interesting. They're both sets of Jews. They're both from Jerusalem. They were all big on what was happening on the outside, the things you do, the externals. That's what they were so big about. And so in this Isaiah passage, he's calling them out and saying, you're acting like hypocrites. They're telling them you've got ancient traditions that were handed down, and you're putting them above commandments. Jesus was against that. He was against legalism. And legalism is a big fancy word, but that just means acting a certain way or following certain rules because you think that's going to give you life. You think that you're going to be saved if you follow the right rules. That's not how it works. If you trust in God, he will change your heart, and you will follow some of those rules. You will do good things. But doing those good things doesn't save you. The one who rescued you from sin is the one that saves you. Jesus is the one that saves you, and he is the one in which you'll find eternal life. So let's go to the next slide, because after all of this happens with the Pharisees, Jesus is going to tell them, what really matter? In verse 10 and 11, he says, and he, talking about Jesus, called the people to him. So he had been talking to the Pharisees. He had been pretty stern with them, but now the rest of the crowds, that were he called all of them to him. And he said, he called the people to him, and he said to all the people, hear and understand, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a person. So here you are. What, what normally goes into your mouth? Okay, air, food. Normally you put food in it, right? The Pharisees were concerned because the disciples were not washing their hands. They were going to ingest that uncleanness. Remember that uncleanness we were talking about? They didn't want them to eat with dirty hands. That would make them dirty, they thought. But Jesus said, no. What goes into your mouth? does not defile you. Well, what does it mean to defile? So defiling something mean, means to spoil it, means to make it filthy. Think about 
And if you have brand new sneakers and they're white all over, just completely white, brand new sneakers. Have anybody had brand new white sneakers? All right. So that's not quite, I'm talking about like so white, they're like, you can't hardly even see them because they're so bright, right? That would be like pure sneakers, right? Now let's see if you, you put those brand new sneakers on. They're all white. You go walking out in the field. And the first thing you do is you step in a big pile of dog poop. Let me tell you, you just defiled those sneakers, all right? That's what happened to those sneakers, defilement. So what Jesus is saying is what goes into your mouth, that's not what defiles you. He says something else is something comes out of your mouth, and that's what defiles you. So what makes you dirty is not what you put in your mouth to eat, but instead what comes from your heart. And that's important. I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. So the stuff that's in your heart makes a difference. What you truly are inside of you, your heart, your inner being, your spiritual being, that's what comes out through your mouth. And if it's damaged inside, if it's sick inside, then you're gonna, if the things that come out are going to defile you. Now, if you're not saved, that should scare you. Because that means what's naturally going to come out of your heart, no matter what you eat or what you do or what rules you follow, what comes out of your heart is what's going to defile you. But hey, here's the good news. If you're saved, then the reason that you believe Jesus has regenerated your heart. You have a new heart that Jesus gave you. If you're a believer, I'd say trust in God because he has made your heart new. It's because of what Jesus did on the cross for us that allows us to have that new heart. And that new heart, the stuff that will come out of our mouth, is going to be different than it would if we hadn't been changed. So, trust in God. He can make your heart new, and that's exciting stuff. So, let's move on. Let's see. The disciples get concerned about what's happening here. All right? Peter's on the job. All right? Get ready. I love Peter. He's great. So, let's go to verse 12. It says, then the disciples came and said to him, said to Jesus, um, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? All right, so talk about Captain Obvious, all right? They come in. Jesus knows that he's offended the Pharisees, all right? There's no doubt in Jesus' mind. And so the disciples are worried about these respected leaders, the Pharisees that came down from Jerusalem, Jesus, do you realize that you offended them? And here's the thing. Jesus didn't care. He didn't care that they were offended by him telling them they need to follow the commandments of God, not the traditions of men. I mean, the implications of what Jesus was saying to the people and to the Pharisees were huge. And the disciples, they wanted to make sure they heard Jesus right. They're like, do you realize you offended them? Yeah. Yeah. He knew. So let's keep going. Jesus keeps talking to him in verses uh, 13 and 14. All right, it says, he answered. This is what Jesus said. Every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. You know, Israel liked to call itself a plant. There's all kinds of references to Israel as the plant. And Jesus is saying, you know what? If my father didn't plant it, if my father didn't draw them to me, I'm going to root them up. When I think of rooting up, I think of going out to the garden outside. My wife made a great garden. She's got a green thumb. It's amazing. All this stuff's growing. You go out there, you're going to root up the weeds. Don't root up my blackberry bush. It's amazing. It produces all kinds of blackberries. I know... You are really concerned about that. But I would not root up my blackberry bush. I love my blackberry bush, right? But if there are weeds in the garden, I'm going to root them up. And that's what Jesus says is going to happen. That's the analogy that he's drawing. And what Jesus is talking about is the hypocrites, the Pharisees that he was just talking about. Then he goes on talking about the blind leading the blind. Have you ever seen a blind person? Anybody? 
They usually have like a stick or something or somebody's leading them. My grandmother, before she died, she had macular degeneration. Her eyes, like she was blind. She could not see anything. She always had somebody leading her, someone leading her down the steps, right? You want somebody that can see well to lead her down the steps, right? Because if somebody was blind and trying to lead my blind grandmother down the stairs, how would it turn out? Yeah, not, not too good. It wouldn't, wouldn't turn out very good. You don't want a blind person leading a blind person. And Jesus is saying that's exactly what's happening with the Pharisees. They don't know. They're hypocrites. They don't realize that it's the heart that makes a difference. They don't realize they need to trust in God. They think they need to follow rules and traditions. So, trust me, it's never right to follow a blind guy into the ditch. Let's finish up here with verses 15 through 20. And we're going to see the explanation of why Jesus is saying all this. And then we're going to wrap up. It says, but Peter said to him, explain the parable to us. I know that sounds brilliant, but, you know, those were pretty obvious parables. But, but Peter wants to make sure, he says, explain this parable to us. And he said, talking about Jesus, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. What makes you filthy are the things that you do that break the commandments. Jesus is talking about, he already mentioned the fifth commandment, which is honor your father and your mother, right? Who remembers what the sixth commandment is? Anybody? Take a wild guess. You got one in ten chance, right? No, but very close. Murder. Do not murder. That's the sixth commandment. Guess what? Take a look at your passage. Jesus says, out of the heart come evil thoughts. Murder. He's talking about evil thoughts and murder. That all goes along with murder and anger. That's the sixth commandment. What's the seventh commandment? Look at the Bible. What does it say? The seventh commandment is adultery. That's right. You're not supposed to commit adultery. And sexual immorality goes along with that. Guess what Jesus says? After he talks about murder, he says don't do adultery or sexual immorality. What do you all think? The seventh or the uh, eighth commandment is no stealing. You are catching on. You are catching on. So Jesus here, he says, theft. All right. What about the ninth commandment? False witness. That's right. You are getting it. You are getting it. He says, he says, false witness, slander. These are the kind of things that defile a person. Jesus is rattling off the commandments. He's rattling off scripture. Those are the commands from God that we need to follow. He says, if you're not doing these things, that's what will defile you. Not if you don't follow these rules that men came up with, or humans came up with, or what you're used to doing, that's not going to make you filthy. What will make you filthy is if you don't listen to what God says to do. But here's the catch. The reason that our heart can be changed is because of what Jesus did for us. God sent Jesus on a rescue mission to the earth. He took on human flesh. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross. Three days later, he raised from the dead. And because of that, we can know that we have forgiveness of sins. That's what makes our heart new, what Jesus has done for us. That's the difference between human religion and divine religion. You see, human religion looks like religion. But it's man-made. It's rules that men come up with. It's their traditions that they have. But divine religion is the religion that God gave us. That's the real religion that tells us God came to rescue us and he changes us. So human religion versus divine religion. Human religion starts with things that are outside of you because they want everything to be seen. They want to look like good people. And so all their traditions follow what's outside but divine religion is about what comes out of your heart 
And that's what Jesus says. Trust in him. Believe in him. Let him change your heart. And the things that come from your heart will not defile you. But if you do not do that, and you do the things against what he's talking about, that's when the things from your heart will defile you. Human religion is all about how you look to others. The way you look, the appearance that you have. You may look so holy because you have so much human religion that you do everything right. And that's great. People can look at you and they can see you up here and they see you come up here and pray. They can see you up here sing and praise. They can see you do all these things that are right. But if your heart is not right, that's just human religion. Divine religion is about how God changed you. The person that is with divine religion shows God is the one that makes the difference. You see, the difference here is human religion starts with the external, and because of that, it'll never affect the essential life inside of you. The life that means something to you will never be affected by that human religion because it has no power. But divine religion starts inside of you. And then it affects everything outside of you. I want to say that again to make sure you all get that. If it's human religion, you're following all these rules that you made up or that other people made up or that you think sound good and make you feel good. Do all those, those things externally. It will not change your heart. Your heart will still defile you. But if it's divine religion, for you trust in what God has done for you, it's your heart that changed. Essential life has changed you. And if you are changed then everything outside is going to change. All the externals will be different because your heart is now different. So if God changed your heart, you're going to desire him. And so I say, trust in him. Trust and believe in God. It's going to drive you to, to love him every day. I mean, that's the things that your heart will want to drive you to do. Let him change your heart by trusting in him. When you trust in him, you're going to want to go meet him in prayer. You're going to want to go figure out what he's saying in his Bible. And day after day of that, it doesn't all happen in day number one. You're not going to be totally sanctified. But day after day of that, the Holy Spirit keeps shaping you into who you need to be. And as that process goes throughout your life, the Holy Spirit will make you more like Christ every day. And you know what? It's that same passion that's driving you, that when you mess up and you sin, that shame and that guilt that you feel, because the Holy Spirit is saying, you did wrong, you shouldn't have done that. That same passion will drive you back to Jesus because you trust in him. We make mistakes. Do those mistakes drive you back to Jesus to repent of it? Or does it make you turn away? Trust in him. He can handle it. Believe in Jesus. Accept that divine religion by believing and turning away from your sin. It's through trust in him that Jesus changes your heart. And if you don't want to be defiled, you don't want to be like that white sneaker that steps in the poo. You want to be so that your heart is changed that you'll love God. That's eternal life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. If he has changed your heart, that is eternal life. Things outside of you might change. People might think you look weird. You may do weird things. You might wonder, why did I do that? That was really loving for that person, but that's really not like me. That's well, because Jesus is changing you into who he is.